If there's anything that competes for your attention, for faith, over faith in God, it's faith in your money. You don't believe me? Listen to the words of Jesus. He says this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Cannot serve God and money. Now, of all the things that Jesus chose as God's competition, it's money. I mean, it's not God and the devil. After all, that would seem logical, wouldn't it? It's not you can serve God and you can serve yourself. No, Jesus said that you can't. You can't be devoted. You can't serve. You can't love God. And your affection and your devotion is toward money. It just can't happen that way. Well, a couple questions this brings to our attention. The first is this. What is your relationship like with money? Think about that for a moment. What is your relationship like with money? Does it rival God? Is God perhaps your money? Or do you worship God with the resources that he has blessed you with? Or if you're a Christian, have you ever heard what the Bible truly teaches about our finances? Well, we've been in this series called Giant Faith, and we've been examining the life of Abraham. And if you're our guest today, if you're joining us online, I want to welcome all of you here today. If you have not listened to the first two messages, I would strongly encourage you to go back on our YouTube channel or perhaps uh, on our website at pathwayschurch.us, and you can catch up on some of that content. Week one, we talked about that giant faith begins in friendship with God. And then week two, we talked about our future and how we need to step out in faith like Abraham did. Well, today I want to talk about faith and finances. Now, all the message notes, scriptures, and even more content will be on our mobile app. You can go to this weekend and look for message notes there, and you can follow along with me as we work through our text and content for today. If you have a Bible, go with me to Genesis chapter 14. Now, let me set some background and context for you. In Genesis 14, this is a war story, okay? There's a battle that takes place because there are four kings who are coming eastward into the Jordan Valley, and they are going to defeat five kings, five existing kings in this territory, and here's what takes place. They actually capture one of Abraham's uh, family members, his nephew by the name of Lot, okay? So, Abram hears that this battle has taken place, and he hears that his nephew Lot has been taken captive. So here's what he does. He grabs 318 trained men along with some allies, and he pursues those uh, armies, those troops that had defeated the kings there, and he defeats them in this epic nighttime battle. So Abraham has victory. He brings Lot back home and everybody is celebrating and Abraham is now a military man. Abraham now is decorated. He's a war hero. And here's where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 14, beginning with verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He brought out some food and drink for Abraham and his men. He was priest of, most, of God most high. And he blessed Abram saying, blessed by Abram, by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then verse 20 says this. Then Abram gave him a tenth. Everybody say tenth. Tenth. Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, there are four things, four things that I want to highlight. Actually, three things that I want to highlight from this passage, okay? The first is this. The very first time that we find the word tithe, tenth, in the Bible is found in Genesis 14. The very first time, tithe meets tenth. The very first time that we find the word tithe in Scripture is in Genesis 14. The second thing that I want to highlight to you is that, is that when... Abram gave to Melchizedek, to the priest, to the, to the, to the priest of God, Melchizedek. By the way, can we just call him Mel or like Father Mel, Pastor Mel, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eventually hack his name up, okay? Melchizedek, we'll just call him Mel, okay? So, 
Father Mel. Everybody say Father Mel. Father Mel, he came and he brought bread and wine. And when uh, Abram came back, here's the second thing. Abram gave a tithe, a tenth to Pastor Mel, not because he had to. See, he didn't have to do this. This was not a command of scripture in the Old Testament at the time that Abram returned a tenth to Father Mel. Follow me here, okay? Because oftentimes people will say, well, a tithe is actually attached to the Old Testament law. The point being that what Abraham did, what he did in Genesis 14 preceded the law. It was almost like he intuitively knew. He would say to himself something like this, for all the good that you have done for me, how could I not give back to you? He just, we just heard how he, he had the blessing of protection by rescuing his nephew Lot. We just saw how he was blessed by, by Pastor Mel. And so it's like, you know, Abram just said, I want to return. I want to give this back to you. It was already in his heart. Friends, hear me, hear me loud and clear. Giving is always a heart issue. When your heart is enthralled with the God of the universe, it makes it so much easier to release and give your finances back to him. Number three, third highlight. This story in Genesis 14 is descriptive, not prescriptive meaning that this describes what Abraham did. The text cannot prescribe what we are to do with our finances. Does that make sense? So it it says, listen, Abraham did this. The text doesn't say, you can't use this text to say to people, well, then you ought to tithe, okay? That's shoddy interpretation. That's poor exegesis. So now you might be asking yourself, okay, Adam, so what can we actually, with that being said, what can we extrapolate from the text in Genesis 14? Here's the key principle. If you're taking notes, write it down. Here it is, right here. It's on our mobile app. Abraham's giving was in response to God's blessing. It was a response to what God had already done in Abraham's life. You remember in Genesis 12, he gave him three promises, right? He gave him a land, he gave him a nation. He said, you're gonna be a nation and you're gonna be a people that's gonna bless all other peoples throughout all of history. So Abraham was already experiencing the blessing of God as he stepped out into the promises. Now, did you know that for you and I, the Bible is filled with over 3,000 promises designed for our spiritual lives as we follow Jesus Christ? Did you know that? Some of those promises are like this. If God is for us, Romans tells us, who can be against us? God says, I will never, ever leave you or forsake you. One of my favorite promises is in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God. You know, another promise attached to Psalm 23 is John 14. He says this, listen, if I go away, I promise you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And I promise you, he even says that, I promise you, I will return for you and you will be with me in my father's house. Oh, Now, why, why can we bank on those promises for our spiritual lives, both now and forever? Why? Because God gave us Jesus. And the Bible says that in Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. They're secure. They're secure because what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, his forgiveness, his redemption, who he is as the son of God, the Messiah, he secures our promises. We can bank on those promises. Okay, so what does giving, what does it indicate about our lives? There are two indicators that I wanna briefly walk you through. First, giving reflects our heart of worship to God. When we give to God, it's a form of worship. It's a form of worship. The world says it this way. You've probably heard this before. Put your money where your, yeah, put your money where your mouth is. Jesus says it this way, put your money where your heart is. That's why he says it this way in Matthew chapter six, his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The point being, follow your money and you'll find your heart. If you're a Christian, don't say your heart is with the Lord if your bank account doesn't support that statement. 
The second thing that giving indicates is where your faith lies. See, when we give, it expresses that our faith is in God. It's not in ourselves. It's not in our jobs or our livelihood. It's not in our 401k. It's not in our banking system. I know what happened in Silicon Valley in the tech world and that sector. Listen, at the end of the days, there are gonna be variables. There's gonna be recessions. There's gonna be crisis. But the faith, the giant faith of the believer is in the foundation of who God is as our source and provider of all good things. And when you give, what you're saying to God is giving declares that our confidence is in his abundance, period, end of story. Okay, so let's ask this question. What is God's goal for our expression of faith when it comes to our finances? Here's God's goal. This is huge, okay? This is really big. Here's God's goal for the area of finances. We have giant faith. It's for you to be financially generous. God wants you to be financially generous. That is his goal. In order for you to reach that goal, it's one of the reasons that we designed this assessment. I've been saying this every week, but what do you do with it? Can you pull it out and can you wave it at me? Come on, wave it at me. Pull it out and wave it at me. If you're online, you can uh, check the chat. They're going to put it in the chat. Also on our website, there's a ribbon at the top where you can uh, just click that. You can print this off. You can take this. And uh, this assessment is going to help you determine where you are when it comes to faith and finances, where you currently are, and then where you want to go in taking steps of obedience with God, okay? Okay. Now, let me give you some uh, practical application when it comes to becoming financially generous, okay? Um, and let me uh, uh, say just a, a statement at the front of this. Every, every, it takes giant faith to become generous, and every step toward financial generosity is a step of faith. Giant faith to become generous, you don't just wake up one day and become financially generous. That's a growth process. For some people, it's two years. For other people, it's 10 years, depending on your relationship with money, depending on how well you do financially, depending on where you are in planning and budgeting and being really consistent based on your mindset toward money. If you have a scarcity mindset, you were raised in a home where there wasn't much, you, you approach money differently than somebody who was in a home where things were relatively secure and safe, there was financial planning, you knew what was happening, you saw tithing modeled, you saw generosity modeled to you, then that becomes a lot easier. You were raised in a Christian home. But if you weren't and you walked in and maybe today you're a guest and you're saying, what, really? Okay, so here's some practical application for you to begin to take steps toward uh, becoming financially generous. The first is this. Here it is. Start giving. Everybody say start giving. Start just start giving. Start giving. As your pastor, I don't care how much it is. Just start it. Just get the habit. If you're a teenager, if you're a young adult, listen, start giving now. It's a lot easier to start giving when you have less zeros. Because the more zeros you have, you're like, ooh. Right? Right? You know why? Because as the zeros increase, your standard of living in increases. But when you're young and you set that discipline, it makes it so much easier. Parents, that's why you need to teach uh, 10, 10, 80 to your kids. That's what we teach. Tie 10%, you save 10, you live on 80. When Grace first got her first job, we said, hey, we're actually gonna switch those percentages. She's like, what? Why are we switching them? We said, because we want you to start saving for college. See? So, uh, young people, start now. If you're an adult, just start giving. I don't care the amount. You can go on our mobile app, click down on the screen to giving, set up a reoccurring gift. You can give in the boxes. Just begin the habit. It just gets you started. It's like exercising a muscle, right? Have you ever done uh, bicep curls? You know what they call when you sit down and you do them this way? They call them preacher curls. That's awesome. Preacher curls. You know, when you do preacher curls, you, gotta, you can't start off and put 35s on each side. You bust out your elbows. So you just start with a little five. Wait, just, okay, take the bar. Doesn't matter. Just start the habit. All right, here's the second thing. Commit to tithing. Commit to tithing. Everybody say commit to tithing. 
To get there as adults, you have to begin to budget. You have to begin to think through. Maybe you need to talk to a financial advisor. You've got to relieve some debt. You've got to figure this out, but you have to commit to tithing. I was talking to one of our committed congregants here at Pathways Church. Her name is Carissa. And we were talking about baby dedication and how she wanted to dedicate her beautiful baby, Jamari, who was dedicated last time we did baby dedications unto the Lord. And then she said, you know, Pastor Adam, I would love to, I want to share my giving story with Pathways. So why don't you take a listen to Carissa's story. So I grew up at church and would occasionally tithe. However, I never consistently tithed. And I knew biblically tithing meant to give 10% of your income, but it wasn't something that I did for most of my adult life. And in the fall of 2021, I felt God nudging me to trust in him and to give faithfully. And I knew that that meant 10%, not 1%, not 5%, not what I felt like I could give. And it honestly was a little terrifying and I decided to step out in faith and set a goal for 2022 to tithe 10% of each paycheck. I became a single mom unexpectedly when my son was a month old this last summer. And so of course my first thought was I am gonna have to stop tithing. I had no idea how I was going to find thousands of dollars in my budget each month, going from a two person income to paying all the bills by myself without any financial support. And after praying about the situation, I knew that I needed to trust God and continue tithing, even though I wasn't sure how it was going to work. It was really scary. I was on an unpaid maternity leave, and so I, I prayed, and I really my faith grew tremendously during those months of learning that God is my provider and that he can take care of anything. And truly, with him, nothing is impossible. And so every day I just prayed and gave him every challenge that came up, whether it was a financial challenge, an emotional challenge, having a little one in the home. And I really saw him support me in every aspect of my life. I think it's okay to acknowledge that it's really scary, right? It's, it's scary to give over control of your money and your finances and have that be an unknown. And we have no idea the blessings that God has in store for us. And so when you step out in faith and just take that first step, God will bless you in ways that you can't even imagine. And so I would encourage people, take that first step and God, God will guide you the rest of your journey and the blessings will abound. I think God works on our heart and prepares us even before we know what is coming. And so, I have no idea why God decided in the fall of 2021 to nudge me towards having faith in Him. And now that I can look back on the entire year, I absolutely understand that I had to grow my faith and my relationship in God to be able to make it through what I was going to go through. And had I not taken that step, I think it would have been really easy for me to honestly just drown in the difficulty of the season and the journey that I had to walk through. Um, however, because I took that step in faith, it allowed me to grow in ways that I never could have imagined in this past year. And I'm grateful that I listened to God's small voice speaking to me week after week, even though I couldn't see the big plan at that moment. And so I think it's always helpful to reflect back and see where maybe God has guided you down a certain path or encourage you to take certain actions because it's all part of his greater plan. Even though it can be frustrating at times when you can't see the plan or you don't know the why. Because I think innately, as human beings, we wanna know the why. The why behind why we have to do something, why do we have to listen, why does the situation have to be the way that it is. And sometimes, you have to have faith that maybe you don't know the why, uh, but God always knows the why. Wow. What a beautiful human being, right? Can we uh, express our encouragement and join together in our faith with Chris as she grows in her faith? Personally, knowing her story and walking with her for this season, a couple things stand out to me. First, she, by herself, on her own volition, said, I need to challenge myself to grow in my faith. That's huge. 
In, in other words, she basically took her own assessment and said, you know what? I know what God's word says and I wanna be committed here, so I'm gonna take a step of faith. The second thing, she references blessings. Do you know what those blessings were for her? Emotional support and stability from the Holy Spirit. It was the community of the body of Christ walking through as a single mother. She didn't know that in 2021. She was praying that the relationship would stand strong, that it would endure, but in 2022, it ended. Not by her. And yet who was there for her? Our church family, Jesus, and her faith was growing because of our, her obedience. Remember what I said last week? Obedience is the key to a giant faith. Amen? Amen. All right, so let me give you the clear teaching of God's word on tithing. Here's what God's word says. God himself says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Should we say a prayer? Should we go to church? What do we do? God says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? Answer in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be enough room uh, 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 not be room enough to store it. Now, let me give you four highlights very quickly from this passage of scripture. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. God does not change. God does not change, therefore his commands do not change. Number two, if you are not tithing, you're robbing God. Number three, at some level, you are inviting a curse upon your life. God's not cursing you. You're cursing yourself because you're choosing not to involve God in your finances. Number four, here's good news. When you begin to tithe, you begin to open your life up to the blessing of God. You open your life up to God's blessing. And here's the thing. As we've been studying in our passage, we are blessed to be a... Oh, that was weak sauce. I don't know. Maybe you got hung up on number one and two or something. I don't know. Maybe you feel like you're robbing God. We are blessed to be a blessing. All right. So when I was growing up in the King James Version, uh, the, 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 the word, it wasn't the floodgates of heaven. It was the windows of heaven. Have you ever heard that translation? God would open up the windows of heaven. Oh, my mom used to say this to me. Oh, Adam, when we tithe, our family, the windows of heaven are being opened up. And I'd say, yeah, yeah, okay, mom, okay. Windows of heaven. Now, what does scripture say? The, here's what came to my mind as I was putting this message together. Remember last week we talked about uh, being a funnel of blessing? From the windows of heaven to the funnel of blessing. From his holy heaven to your life of blessing. You say, okay, Adam, what, what, what do you mean by that? What does the scripture say? There will be so much blessing that you don't have room to store it. Woo! This makes me excited. You know why? Because most people are at this point in the message, I told you it was heavy, didn't I? I don't know. I told I, I t you sweaty hands, you got to do some more shoulders, man. Get on them preacher curls. Get on them preacher curls. Now, look, look, most people at this point in the message start getting a little nervous because if you're Christian, here's what they're going to say. Oh, you're getting into prosperity gospel. No, I'm not. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I'm getting in to the Bible, there is so much that God wants to fill up your life with so much blessing that you can't store it and it has to be a funnel of blessing. That means you get to bless other people with the resources he's giving you. We are blessed to be a blessing. Ah. Did this illustration help? Did this work? From the windows of heaven to the... But you know how we access those windows? When we are obedient in worship to give back to God what rightfully he deserves and we honor him with our resources. They're not even ours anyways. They belong to him. All right. Thank you, James. All right. 
And you know where that leads us? When you start to get in, see your life as a funnel of blessing, you get turned on to generosity because it no longer becomes about a percentage. I don't wanna live my financial life on a percentage. I wanna live my life through the voice of God with what I should do with my resources. I wanna have tithing. I want, that's 101, friends. That's 101. I wanna to get to the place where God's like, hey, I want you to move this around. I want you to handle this. I want you to meet that need. I want you to go here. It was one of the reasons that I believe God led us to do taking it to the streets. I think it's one of the, because I believe it broke something inside of us as a congregation. It showed us the power of generosity. Man, we laid out $6,000 on this platform, on this stage a couple of weeks ago. And the stories of what God did with those little gifts, they changed us as a congregation. So much so, I think we're gonna to begin to start living as a generous church in a way that we don't even know what that looks like yet. Because we can begin to leverage our resources to be a blessing to our valley, to our community. And isn't that what you want? I mean, there's this family in our church and they were so inspired by paying off lunch debt. They heard about this and you know what they did? They felt moved and prompted by God. A woman woke up in the middle of the night and she was like, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. I need to do this. And she called and talked to her husband. And he was like, okay, if this is what you feel led. And I gotta tell you, it's not like her husband has been a believer for 20 years. He's newer to the faith. He's heard it, but now it's touched his heart. They went to the Nina School District. They did all 11 elementary schools. They wrote a check for $6,000, $5,700. They rounded up to $300 and they blessed 300 families and canceled the debt of every kid in Nina. school. <laughs> yeah, you can speak in tongues all day long and you can pray long prayers, but don't tell me your heart was with, with God unless you're generous with your resources. Don't tell me how many verses you know. Don't tell me, listen, friends, put your money where your, your heart is. I mean, it's just Jesus. I just... <laughs> okay. This is what we all want, don't we, friends? This is what we all want. We want to be generous. And then take small steps of obedience and let's have giant faith together. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in this moment, God, you're calling us to a place where, God, you wanna lead us to a place where we have giant faith in you. And I know this message is, is challenging, it's convicting for all of us. Why? Because it, it calls upon the very thing that rivals our affection for you. It's money. We need it. We have a relationship with it. God, there, there's so much pressure with money. And yet, God, you call us to a place of obedience toward you in this area of finances. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer and you're thinking to yourself, well, so what is my next step? I don't know what your next step is. That's between you and the Lord. My job is to present the scriptures, to do it in a way that would encourage you and inspire you. It's the Holy Spirit who takes now the highlighter and says, you know what? This is where you are. This is your next step. You have the assessment. You know what it is. You see it. Maybe you need to take a step. Maybe you need to take a 90-day tie challenge. Maybe you just need to start giving. Maybe, maybe you could, the best thing you could do is reach out to Thrive It and figure out who your financial advisor is. I don't know, but you've got to figure that out, friends. Because what I know is I want this church here at Pathways to have giant faith in every area. In every area. Now, maybe you're here today and you're not a, a follower of Jesus Christ. And your step today is to receive the greatest gift. He's not calling you to be a giver quite yet. He's calling you to be receiver of grace. Oh, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, if you're online, you can just say, hey, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ. If you're in the room, though, and you want to make this decision for Jesus Christ, could, could you just raise your hand in this moment and then you can put it down? I just want to acknowledge you. You're here today and 
you want to give your life to Jesus Christ? Anybody? Be a receiver of a gift, the greatest gift, the gift of grace. Okay. Great news. This message was for every single person here today because nobody is an unbeliever. <laughs> this message, you are now sitting under the clear teaching of God's word when it comes to faith and finances. So really, the altar call, if you will, is not for salvation. The altar call is for growth, giant faith. That's the altar call, unless I miss somebody online. So if you're watching from Albuquerque or Ocala, Florida, or somewhere in Charleston, South Carolina, and you got saved, you received the gift. You received the gift. In fact, can we pray together as a church family? We don't know who's online. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you love us. You send Jesus to save us. We repent of our sins. Forgive us. Come into our lives so that we can know you love you and have giant faith in you. In Jesus' name, the strong son of God. And everyone who agreed to this prayer, shout it. Yeah. Amen. Hey, can we celebrate some of those people online today, perhaps who have given their lives to Jesus Christ? Can we celebrate? Praise the Lord.